How am I doing well? Just wait for everyone to get online. Looks like we're online, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in for another Tuesday night. Um, yeah, with it. Seeing a few people shouting out, doing shout outs. Hope everyone's having an awesome week. Um, and just waiting for Facebook to tune online. So, um, I can see the clock ticking over there. So, um, yeah, cool, cool. Greg, all good, mate, when you're ready. Um, yeah, hopefully everyone's having an awesome week. Today's obviously end of financial year. Um, most people are normally excited. They're always talking about, you know, end of financial year, yeah, right? Um, it doesn't really matter about tax time anymore. Uh, you know, so many stimulus checks flying around. A lot of news out there, which uh, I'm excited to get into. And uh, interesting, um, interesting to see, you know, what funny things they're talking about today in the news. So, uh, yeah, with it, we'll get straight into it, seeing a lot of your messages come through, not seeing much onto the Facebook page for some reason, but that's all good. Maybe their algorithms are starting to block us over there. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, Want to get straight into the news. Uh, if you are not onto Birchfeed, you should be onto Birchfeed. Basically, Birchfeed is history before it happens. Lots of info that are put out there on a daily basis. Some of it's random. Some of it's, you know, very relevant to what's happening out there in the financial markets at the moment. Lots of cool data. Um, if you guys are on Birchfeed, feel free to ask me any questions about anything you may not understand in there. Put out lots of content every day. Some of the things I read, some of the things I research, not everything I put in there. Uh, if you're not in Birchfeed, make sure you get amongst it. So uh, this week we have seen uh, 33 cases Ironic, right? Ironic. Uh, 33 cases in uh, Victoria started a new massive spread and panic, and uh, suddenly we're in for round two, um, you know, totalitarian fascist sort of uh, Marxism sort of, uh, you know, agendas that are playing out at the moment. People will be under house arrest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to be very clear on something that I think um, we will start to see uh, from tomorrow onwards. Uh, it is tax time, and uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, you know how you're going to save your depreciation and you know, how much you're going to get back on your tax return and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to leave that for Rid One uh, from One Path Accountants for those of you that you know watched him previously. Um, I'm just seeing some um, uh, the um, the comments about the uh, the birch feed. I appreciate the feedback on that, but. Yeah, with, I'm going to leave tax over to Ridwan, but I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, what we can expect to see this uh, tax season because we have got so many businesses, so many of them, some of them just before, you know, in the financial year have gone into administration, into liquidation, into bankruptcy. Um, they're already pulling up stunts and they're saying, look, we're, we're just throwing the towel in now and uh, we're going to call for bankruptcy. So... Yeah, you know, that is happening already without us, uh, you know, seeing reports. So over the course of this tax season that we're heading into, what can we expect to see? We're going to see companies reporting that they're making a million dollars a week, a billion dollars a week, and now they're making zero income every week. They're making a quarter of what they made, half of what they made. This is where it all comes out. Are they going to tell people, don't, are they going to tell the stock list of companies you don't have to report this year? That would be interesting. Uh, but if they do report, they, most of them are going to be writing that they're bankrupt in self and then totally screwed up. Um, so, yeah, with it, um, you know, it's exciting time. It's an interesting time. What will come from that? Who knows? But this is the quarter to watch out for. This is the big part of the quarter. I feel that somewhere around uh, August, September, October, we're going to see the real, um, the real fun, um, you know, the real fun start out there in the marketplaces. So, um, on that note, we've already seen here is an article. I was reading some articles from News.com 
Now this one here says, Qantas is axing jobs as a sign that the worst is yet to come for Australia's economy. Australia is laying off 6,000 staff, immediately retiring all of its 747s in a move that should shake the Australian economy to a core. The flying kangaroo has given us a glimpse of the future. No more 747s, right? No more 747s. Here we go. Uh, more jobs will be cut as businesses understand uh, the new reality. I'm not laughing or making anything. I actually know a lot of people that work um, at Qantas, and I hope that everyone's okay. And, and you know, if there's anything that I can do or help out with or whatever, feel free to reach out. But this, this is a writing that's on the wall, guys. This isn't. This is Qantas today. Um, apart from you know Beyond Meats, apart from you know fast food outlets, apart from any of the big major national uh, businesses out there. Yeah, these businesses are going to be going to the wall over the next few months and it's going to get a lot worse. We're only starting to see the start of it. So there's a lot of geniuses out there at the moment who over the course of the last three months have gone, oh, wow, we're, I'm a stock market genius. I'm a share, I'm trading shares. I've got a big share portfolio, right? I'm also not here to constitute any uh, financial advice to anyone here. Um, just need to be very careful of you know what is to come. So uh, I am ready. I'm ready to put money and move it into the stock market. It is not ready yet for me to go in. Um, for me, somewhere around 15,000, 17,000 on the Dow Jones uh, is where I'll start putting money into the stock market. Um, but yeah, basically here we are uh, on top of the 6,000 layoffs. So 6,000 Qantas employees have lost their job as of this week. Qantas is standing down further uh, 15,000 staff. Half of them are stood down until international flights resume, which will mean years without work for some employees. Uh, they are permitted to work other jobs while stood down and will continue to accrue leave from Qantas. However, it would be crazy to, to assume that these people will remain with the company. So the loss of jobs could be even higher than the current 6,000 employees. It takes time for a business to even recognize the extent of change needed. Qantas has actually acted quite fast, eliminating a huge chunk of its workforce and nearly raising nearly $2 billion takes time. It is a process requiring many lawyers, bankers, international meetings, and meetings to the board of directors. Um, memory serves me correct, the CEO here actually went and traded uh, oil, the oil contracts, when uh, and buying oil when it was very low with their surplus funds. So, you know, this, that's pretty, um, you know, commendable on his behalf. He actually has the foresight and team actually looked at the opportunity out there in the marketplace. So, um, it says here, one reason Qantas has been able to be uh, so expedient is, is the, the impact of the aviation bright and clear. At the time of writing, Qantas had just six planes in the air above Australia. Six for a company with 29,000 employees. 29,000 employees um, Qantas have. 6,000 got stood down. Now, that's 20% of the workforce that got stood down in a week. Potentially another 40% of the business would be stood down, could be stood down over the course of the next few months. Uh, that's massive, right? Um, when we talked about the GFD two years ago, uh, talked about it being um, on a scale of biblical proportions. Um, this is biblical, guys. I, you don't see this stuff. This doesn't happen regularly, right? And it's going to get a hell of a lot worse. Um, just for another couple of links here inside the article, we're going to read them in a moment. Uh, it says the size of the problem in aviation is obvious. That is also why Virgin was so quick to go into administration for other sectors. Medium term issues are still slowly coming into focus. Commercial real estate, retail, public transport, and hospitality will have their days of reckoning ahead. It hasn't even started yet, folks. Hasn't even started yet. Um, they're just printing money to fix up this problem. They're just printing money. The printing of the money, the cheap credit that's out there, is what's going to cause massive inflation. The, the back end, everyone's going to be like, wow, we're winning, just like the stock market, right? And then suddenly people are going to like, fuck, I can't afford to buy a bottle of water. You know, I can't afford to do anything in life. And that's where inflation will uh, take over this uh, this system. Imagine when, and you know, property got slumped, got pumped two years ago, like hard, right? They changed, like liquidity was very hard to uh, get. They were taking liquidity out of the system. And um, on the property market front, um, property got hit 
two years ago, two and a half years ago, and started to recover last year, people will need to find a home to where to invest their money. Um, you know, when they're seeing volatility out there in the markets, they're seeing, you know, lack of returns, lack of yield, you know, opportunities do present themselves in these sort of markets. Um, is it the market's going to collapse? I wish the market would collapse. Everyone's like, oh, I'm waiting for the market to collapse. It's like, well, we'll be waiting a long time because there's a lot of stimulus going to the market to, to stop that from happening. Um, I think in some areas of the markets, we will see recessionary indicators occur. That will probably be in the top end of town. But for affordable, uh, everyday bread and butter sort of real estate, the opportunities are out there um, and they're, they're dry, they are drying up. I wish the market would collapse. If anyone wants to know my view, I wish the property market would drop by 50%, right? So I can go pick up more uh, stock on the cheap. Um, the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, uh, is now saying the pandemic hit global growth harder than expected and that the expected bounce back is not going to plan. So we put in JobKeeper, universal basic income, to stop a recession. It's not going to plan. You're going to need more. Now, I remember a month ago or something, my mum said, oh, watch the news. Um, watch out. They're going to stop this and the economy is going to do this and this. And I'm like, mum, stop watching the news, right? The talks about removing JobKeeper. talks about removing stimulus measures. The fact is, is that they're going to have to extend these. I've got more articles. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, it goes on to say the recovery is projected to be more gradual than progressive previously forecast. The fund wrote in the World Economic Outlook released on Tuesday. Um, nothing really else left in that article that's um, of interest. Um, I'm going to go to a random article that I saw here. Um, yeah, it says here. Did we cover this one last week? I don't, I don't think we did. I don't think we did. Experts predict economic bloodbath when job keeper, job seeker ends. Recession will get weirder despite hard times. Companies are now somehow going broke. Everything is topsy turvy, but we are just saving up, paying for later. Keep an eye on that ASIC insolvency database. And when I opened the check April statistics, I couldn't believe my eyes. April was a month of insane economic uncertainty and gross financial turbulence, but the number of business going broke went down, not up. We did actually read this last week. Um, my next um, talk, conversation, is um, looking at what Scott Morrison, Scamo, has to say about extending stimulus packages. Uh, PM Scamo uh, urged to deliver cash for families and to extend JobKeeper until Christmas. Hey, it's already Christmas, guys. We'll say it's Christmas in uh, July, right? It's July and it's fucking Christmas time, guys. It's Christmas. Opportunities that are out there. This is the opportunistic time, right? Uh, they will not be able to wind back these stimulus measures that they're putting in place, right? And the more they put in, the bigger the problem is going to get, right? The bigger the problem is going to get, the worse things are going to be, um, you know, for, for winding it back and, and, and getting us back on course because they can't. The, the whole system, uh, the monetary system, uh, the way that currency is floating around out there, the liquidity, um, it's on life support, it's in palliative care. We're going to lose, um, we're going to lose the currency, we're going to lose the dollar. And you know, is that going to happen in the next six months? It's not going to happen in the next six months. It's going to happen as they keep printing money, right? They're just going to keep printing money, stimulating the economy. Um, and as they print out all this currency, people are going to be fearful. People are going to be sitting on the sidelines. People are going to be holding back and the velocity of money and the, the way that people are turning that money through the economy is going to slow down. Um, if you were on, um, Birch feed, you would see that in the 60s, Scrooge McDuck used to do education about how the velocity of money occurred in economics. But you wouldn't see that in the media now. Now it's controlling other uh, weirder agendas than teaching people on how currency works. But um, we're going to be in a point where the velocity will speed up later and we will lose our currency. I am 100% confident. I put all my credibility on the line. Um, I've talked about this. Two, three years ago, I told everyone at the time, hyperinflation is way before, you know, we haven't even seen the deflationary period yet two years ago when I talked about it. 
Um, but hyperinflation is something that needs to be talked about at the moment because it's not going to happen today, but you know, two years, three years, four years down the track, five years down the track. In this decade, we will see a hyperinflation uh, erode our currency that we use at the moment, and we will lose our currency. And all the countries around the world will lose their uh, respective currencies they use. But, you know, we're on our way for that. Uh, the savers will get wiped out. The people that are sitting with too, too much debt will get wiped out. The people that are too under leveraged will get wiped out. So it's important to have, you know, a, a strategy in place to, you know, protect yourself, to uh, take advantage of the opportunities that are out there, as well as minimizing risk every step along the way as well. You can hedge your position in all different capacities. Um, debt is a good tool. Uh, I actually have said multiple times over the course of the last you know, maybe three years, I think it started in 2016, I started you know, behind the scenes chatting to all my professional team on the network and saying, look, this is what is going to happen. And at the start, they're like, oh, you know, I don't know. Sounds possible, but it's very far-fetched. And now, you know, those things are starting to take into play. Um, yeah, but we're starting to see it roll out. Um, Looking at the job kit, what does it say? A new report by the Grattan Institute, which is one of those communist sort of, uh, you know, behind the scene political parties. Um, the, uh, says the, uh, that they've urged the Prime Minister to inject up to $90 billion in the economy to help it weather the storm and the biggest economic shock since World War II. Let's just think about that, right? They're asking for another $90 billion. We're talking about billions of dollars, like it's like we're at the pub going, oh, I'll give you fucking 20 bucks, go get another round of drinks. I'll give you another 50 bucks, let's go and have a slap on the pokies, right? We're talking not dollars, right? Let's just think about it, right? We go down the road, we have, you know, some, some money or whatever the case may be, and then um, it could be 100 bucks, right? And then we could have $1,000. And then we could have ten thousand dollars, right? Ten thousand dollars might buy you a car. A hundred thousand might buy you a property. A million dollars would definitely buy you a nice property or multiple properties. A ten million dollars, a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, ten billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars, half a trillion dollars. <laughs> we just say this money all all day long, and they're just printing it off, right? Just we need to do another night. Another ninety billion dollars for everybody. Uh, who would have thought we'd live in this world? I remember as a kid, a millionaire was uh, was wealthy, and uh, yeah, a million bucks won't do much nowadays. Won't do much. Uh, might buy you like fifteen big size Toyotas, right? You get a, a people mover, a family vehicle, brand new. You get fifteen of them for a million bucks. So I remember as a kid, like a million bucks was like, you know, you'd live like a king. You'd, Watch Richie Rich, you have a bowling alley, you'd have your own McDonald's in your house. Your things are changing, right? And they're killing the currency. No one has a value towards it anymore. People do have a, a value for it at this period of time because people are desperate for money. They don't they need hope, they need cash flow, they need money coming through. Um, some people will have weak hands, right? People will be forced to let go of the assets, unfortunately. People will be forced to you know sell stuff off right people will be forced to sell their bitcoin in order to pay their bills right they'll be forced to sell their bitcoin to pay their mortgage they'll be forced to sell their house so they can feed the kids um you know we can see how that could uh, occur in the economy but ultimately as they print off all this money right, people are just gonna be like Fuck, i don't want this money it's gonna go and purchase some more assets or whatever the case may be um, B at the Grattan Institute has urged Prime Minister to inject $90 billion, right? remembering that they've just put a half a trillion dollars, and that's what they've discussed, and that's not including things like the Home Builder or any other you know, comic sort of package that they've put out there for everybody. Um, it says, uh, with the extra $90 billion, that it would include an extension of JobKeeper with a new turnover test for some companies until Christmas. Christmas, so September, October, November, December, right? There's an extra three or four months that we're talking about for JobKeeper to be extended. This is free money for businesses, for people to keep employed, right? I'm going to get on another article shortly talking about what we talked about a long while ago. Um, 
JobKeeper was enacted for six months and is scheduled to wrap up upon the 27th of December, uh, but a universal cutoff is blunt, the Grattan Uni uh, Institute reports. Uh, JobKeeper should be extended for those businesses and employees that are still severely affected by government restrictions. Who's been to the shops lately? Right? It disgusts me. Right? I go to the shops, I fucking hate the shops to start off with. I went today, had to buy a new phone case, I broke my old one. My phone was being recorded on there, so I was out of the case. But I went to JB for high fly and I see all these people sitting there, some with masks, hiding their face, fearing for the worst. Um, you know, there's a whole pile of people, they've got nothing to do, they've got no job. Some of the shops aren't even open. Um, the food courts are fucking miserable. People aren't earning a living. How are they going to pay their bills? How are people going to survive, right? This is a depression. It was a depression since the 11th of October 2018. It was a recession at that point. Um, the wheels were off the cart. It was like, it was like imagine seeing a cartoon and like a, you know the steering wheel pops off. It's like, how do I steer the car? It's gone off a cliff, right? That's what happened on the 11th of December of October 2018. And in September um, 2019, we saw the market go off a cliff. Uh, and for those of you that remember we were doing the Facebook Lives at the time, I was like, I don't have I don't have the answer. I don't know why they are printing so much money via bailing out the, the repurchasing agreement. So doing a hundred billion dollars a day in short term lending uh, central banks in the US. And then here we are, we're in a depression. We're in a depression, right? Call it that or not, people start calling it that, it's a depression, right? You need to act accordingly. Um, is it the same sort of depression that we saw in the 1920s, I don't fucking know, I wasn't here, right? But if we look at what they had to work with in the 1920s, um, and you see what they have to work with today, they didn't have technology, they didn't have the ability to propagandize and, you know, every time you go to Facebook, there's some bloody, or any app, right? I wish I could just delete all the apps that, you know, had an ad for the Corona app, or, you know, they're trying to jam this shit down your throat, right? And it's really, really poor form. But, you know, in the 1920s, they didn't have the ability to just print more money. They used to, they had to go, oh, we'll just, you know, kill the currency. Do you know why coins have the edges around them? Why they're like, you know, got the little lines around the outside edges? Because people used to shave the outside of the coins off and get a little shaving off them and they'd have like a squashed edge or whatever. Um, and then they would go and melt that down, get that gold or silver, go make another coin or another sort of um, use that money and go make another, sell it as a, as a, as a bit of gold. And um, it wasn't like what they've got today, right? Um, I think about you know, the crypto markets. People ask me, you know, Bitcoin and you know, Ethereum and EOS and Litecoin and Monero and Verge and Ripple and all those uh, cryptocurrencies. Going back 10 years ago, right? They've built another liquidity system. If that was created from the system, right? Whatever it is, it's a balance. It's just another balance that they can, you know, have there to play with, right? That's why, you know, one of the things that attracts me to that, and I'm not saying go buy crypto, uh, it's very volatile, um, but yeah, with it, um, I actually sold, for those of you, people ask me about crypto, right? Um, I sold a coin, I paid 600 bucks for it, maybe like three years ago. Um, I sold it for seven grand just for this one coin the other day, and uh, it wasn't that wasn't the price of the coin, um, but I did sell that off because it was like well, seven grand in my pocket. I only put three hundred bucks in there going back, um, you know, three years ago or something like that. Um, <laughs> I see there about XRP. I think that's the mark of the beast. So don't get me started on that. I don't like it at all. So you'll never convert me otherwise. And it's not decentralized. That's why. But um, looking at you know how we can navigate through this time, um, I made a post on Birch Feed this morning. I, I was awake at like five o'clock and I started throwing out stuff to, to the community. And um, yeah, with it, um, the war, right? Everyone goes World War Two, World War Three. What would World War Three? Everyone thinks it's missiles and fucking nuclear bombs and all that sort of stuff. World War III is being played out on everybody at the moment, right? It's psychological warfare, right? It's people that are being conditioned, being programmed. Go on to any news outlet 
right? And you don't see, oh, look at this nice charitable event. This person's done this, this person's done that. It's all global corporations. It's all doom and gloom. And everyone's wanting to fucking throw themselves out the window from reading it. Um, yeah, there's massive manipulation and fear mongering out there in the media. People think, you know, the hate, the divide, you know, being, you know, whether it's sexist, racist, um, you know, whatever it is that people are, you know, trying to use to divide and conquer, it's working out there. And people are focusing on these things and not focusing on what's important, which is, you know, what's inside them. Um, and if we look at, you know, if World War Three is being played out right now, Right? The war games are very different today than what we would have expected, like let's go bomb somewhere, and nuclear bomb go off, whatever, we're all dead. These uh, corporations, these are entities, these are certain people, which you know are playing these, these mind games. You know? And if we're looking, I'm not gonna get too deep in there, but if we look at you know what we have as a difference in 2020 uh, to fight off a depression, um, it is very different, right? We can print money. Do we? If we see someone in the 1920s that was starving, they were having to cross a border of a country, they were fleeing with like two kids attached to them, no food, starvation, no clothes, right? In this depression, people being locked up in their house, brainwashed with more Netflix, they've got the comforts of everything, but it's a depression still. It's a depression. Depression is when you've got less and less money to or currency or wealth to live from um, and we are all in this at the moment and the only way for them to survive and push us through to the other side of this is by you know stimulating the economy so much that we will lose our currency so you know giving universal based income such as JobKeeper I said beforehand everyone's fearful JobKeeper and JobKeeper and will it end? It will, may, potentially, could, who knows I don't believe they will be able to, because if the economy is completely fucked as it is, how's it gonna be when they remove this? It's very, it would be very violent to take it out of the market. It would be aggressive. And um, yeah, obviously cause a lot of shock, which the, the market's not ready for. You go to the shops, tell me what you see when you go to the shops. The market, the, the, the retail sector is destroyed. Many sectors are destroyed. Right, tourism's destroyed, retail's destroyed, um, all different segments of the market are destroyed, and you know they're going to need to stimulate this. They're going to need to push through the next paradigm. But you'll have less rights, you'll have less you know, ability to move, you'll have less freedoms, you'll have less control of your own personal life. So you just be mindful of it. Um, as I was reading beforehand, before I got excited. Uh, on Friday, uh, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, said uh, he accepted that many companies currently receiving JobKeeper had already bounced back in terms of revenue, revenue. I have no doubt that there are many businesses now, fortunately, who have moved back above the tre threshold. I suspect that's uh, absolutely the case, and I certainly hope it's uh, for their sake and their employers. But we're working under the arrangements we put in legislation, and we'll continue to do that in the current phase of this program. This program. This program, right? Who dictate the program? How come Scamo just come up with so much funds so magically, right? And he's like, oh, I've got this money. I've got a half a trillion dollars, more money that's ever been printed before. And I can just give it all to you. And I've taken a loan. Why wouldn't you think, oh, it could take months to pass through legislation, could do this, could do that, right? You know, it doesn't even matter about taxes anymore. Who gives a shit about a tax deduction? Taxpaying is going to pay for this. Everybody's going to pay for it. They're going to pay for it with their freedom. They're going to pay for it with, like, we're entering into a socialist phase of our society. Um, oh, I must have something. Please, state give me, right? That's communism. That's how they fucking live in third world countries. That's how they live in communist states. So, just interesting. Um... Australian unions, here we go. Australian unions always uh, entertains me. Uh, Australia's heading uh, for a cliff where jobs will disappear and income slash uh, unless there is urgent action. Sign our petition demanding uh, the Scamo government extend JobKeeper um, and JobSeeker. The rate is now with the uh, Scamo uh, supplement. So just think about it, guys. Like we have now got 33 
new cases in Victoria, right? 33, don't Google up uh, 33 new cases in YouTube, right? 33 new with that word, with the number at the end of it, into YouTube and see how many countries and how many states all say the same, the same figure, right? Go figure it, it's just a question. Find it interesting. But we've now got this second wave that's occurring, right? Does that mean everyone's gonna be locked down in their house again? Who knows, right? The fear of it, people are fearful, right? They're like, oh, I don't wanna spend any money. I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna do that. Oh, we can't go outdoors. Oh, Melbourne, it'll turn to Sydney. Um, my brother came in the office yesterday. He's like, oh, you should buy a toilet paper. Like, Stop watching TV, mate. <laughs> um, it's, people are being, you know, bought into this. People are being, um, you know, feared into this. And, you know, it has ripple effects in our economy and in the community as general, it's large. Um, it says here, um, the fears that the triple whammy of the 1500 fortnight job keeper, the doubled 1100 job seeker payment and mortgage honeymoon for distressed home loaners all ending at the same time in late September could see unemployment spike and the economy hitting a fiscal cliff, right? I'm sure there's businesses out there where people are like, let's go buy a Lambo, right? Let's go and do this. Let's go do that because they've got this extra revenue, right? It's going to be disastrous for a lot of people. It's going to be disastrous for a lot of people, a lot of businesses, a lot of jobs. Um, you know, if you're employed by someone, you should be looking at the business that you work for, questioning what could this business do in the future? Do I have the right job? Is there other opportunities out there in the market, right? Like what will happen if something changes in the economy? What will happen, what's the, the key man risk in, um, in this business that I'm working for? And they're things that you need to sort of look at as you know, what is, what is the risk surrounding your job? Do you have a secure job? You think you had a secure job. Um, people always want to travel, but Qantas is sacking you know, 20% of the workforce and happy to sack another 60% of it. Another 40%, sorry. Thirty-five percent. So, yeah, looking at it, um, interesting, interesting times. This is the most coolest article I've seen today. And this is an article from Forbes. Forbes, and it reads: Los Angeles, uh, Atlanta, among among cities joining coalition to test to test universal basic income that UBI, right? It's the uh, STD of the economic system, right? Uh, this is what we've been talking about. Talked about it three years ago, universal basic income. Send a link for everybody. Everybody's stuck with commie uh, currency that's coming through. So uh, mayors in uh, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and nine other US cities. So if you think about cities, right? let's say, I don't know much about how many cities and states there are, let's say it's like, how many cities there is, how many states there is, right? Is it, that's 11 cities, right? Um, they said on Monday, today, they will work to launch universal basic income pilot programs, a growing sign that political leaders are beginning to take the idea of guaranteed income seriously in the wake of the scandemic. Uh, key facts, the mayors of Los Angeles, Oakland, California, Atlanta, Georgia, Tacoma, Washington, Newark, um, New Jersey, St. Paul, Minnesota, Jackson, Mississippi, Compton, California, Sheriff of Port, Louisiana, Stockton, California, have joined the mayors for guaranteed income, a coalition advocating for UBI policy, universal basic income, um, or having or the idea of giving out recurring cash payments to all individuals without any strings attached. Right? You can't have it, it's not sustainable. We are on a debt bender, right? We are on a bender with our currency, right? It's gonna go off a fucking cliff. Debt will win, the assets will get inflated, that's how this ends. Having saved into the bank account, who cares about that, right? Your currency is worthless. The money you got in your bank is worthless. It's worthless. Um, interesting. Uh, Mayors for a uh, guaranteed rent, uh, guaranteed income was founded by Michael Cubs, 29-year-old 
may have stopped it. We launched one of the first guaranteed income pilots in the US last year, along with the Economic Security Project, a nonprofit supporting the idea of creating income for all Americans. Through the coalition, we'll advocate collectively for guaranteed income and share information. Each city will launch their own pilot with separate funding streams, either from creating work, working group to find room in the city budget or by forming public private partnerships. Communism. Um, crucial quote is taken that word with the number uh, where direct cash payments are part of the solution offered by the federal government. So I just thought the time was right to organize mayors around the idea because we live in a time of scamdemics. Uh, Tubbs said if it's not the corona scam this year, it will be an earthquake next year, a hurricane the year after, or fires. Folks need to build economic resilience in our cities. Very interesting, guys. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, we're going to see more stimulus packages. We're going to see more volatility out in the markets. This next quarter, giving the heads up, right? Like the last quarter was great. This quarter is going to be, you know, something to watch out for. So just be cautious. Will it happen? Who knows? I'm not a time traveler. May it happen? I'm putting my money on. So um, everything's sort of pointing towards um, that occurring. So on that note, guys, Gonna go to some of your questions. We're gonna go to Facebook. Uh, Jason, hey Nath, Michael, hello mate. Uh, Josh, uh, Gail, hey Nathan, Blink Queensland, hope you're doing well, Gail. Uh, it is end of financial year. Um, so I know you guys, all you ladies up there, um, we're busy today and um, hopefully, uh, you know, all good. I know I've seen a few emails floating around. So um, if you guys own properties, I'd like to manage them, flick us a message. I'd like to. You know, look after your property portfolio for you. Uh, Olivia, let's get an idea underway. I'll contact your team. Haven't heard back yet. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Apologies about that, Olivia. Um, being out of Birch Feed, Mount Drew is God's country. Join and update me. Everybody, join Birch Feed. If you don't, just while you're watching this, go to your computer, get your phone, get your device, whatever you're watching it from. Go to birchfeed.com. Birchfeed.com. It's free. Don't need to pay anything. Get on there. Get amongst it. 1.99% um, interest rate. I'm looking forward to the day when it does get there. Uh, Scamo is the new Oprah. You get a job keeper. You get job seeker. Everybody gets job keeper forever. We are in that world. They're just giving out free money, right? You can't keep doing that. Where is the currency being uh, created from? So, Bridget, hi from Queensland. I uh, hope you're doing well, and uh, I'll be up there shortly to see you ladies. Uh, Nathan, buy some more houses in Cairns. Uh, I like buying properties in Cairns. I haven't bought any there for a long while. The market has gone up. I do own some still there, um, but I'm not buying there at the moment just because it's too expensive. I think my cheapest one there was 20 grand all these years ago. I'm not giving anyone pointers. I'm not buying there, as I said, right? There's many other areas. Uh, for the same money you're buying cans, I'm buying in capital cities. So, yeah. Uh, Manrico, I know that you prefer entry level properties in blue collar areas, but what do you think of those high net worth individuals who purchase top end properties? I've always wondered what their strategy can be besides capital growth. That is it. Good question. Huh? So, um, you know, buy, wait, hope, pray. Uh, it's not really a sustainable uh, model for investing, right? It could work in other areas of one's life. But when it comes to building a property portfolio, you know, if you're buying a property that's um, sort of negative geared in a top end town, let's say a $2 million property that rents for 500 bucks, uh, 800 bucks a week, um, you know, $2 million loan um, at a 5% interest rate beforehand um, would have been $100,000 a year. Uh, 100 grand a year is two grand a week, right? Negative geared. If that property is negative, 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, 80 grand, 60 grand, whatever the property is negative. This is something a lot of people, this is like very property specific guys. Um, if you are buying a, um, a property that's negative geared, if it's negative geared 10 grand a year, you need that property got by $10,000 every year to just break even. So if you buy a property that's negative 200 bucks a week, you need it to go up in 10 years by $100,000 just to get your initial capital back. It's tied up with your money. What have you benefited from the property? So, um, you know, when we look at these top end properties, we need to consider what is their strategy? Do they have a strategy? Is it based on emotion? We covered off um, some top end people last week. 
and some articles about them selling their properties, and they would have made nothing on their properties. They would have made nothing in a decade. It would have been a lost decade or 20, uh, 20 years that they've lost. Uh, Brad, what is new, Mr. Nathan? Birchfeed is going great. A cashless society will only allow the government to control every dollar we make, earn, and already have. How we, uh, how are so many not seeing the bigger picture? Because they're asleep. They're asleep, and um, you know they may see it when it's too late. They will complain about when it's wrong. Um, it's interesting. Um, this is interesting time. So people, um, you know, will be awake. They're the people that will capitalize they will see the opportunity they will educate themselves they will see look this is uh you know this is the boiling water we're not to put our foot in there they'll be able to walk around the danger zone and people will just go walking straight in and get you know sunk in the quicksand so um he's not that silly to buy houses in Cairns right now you wrote that 30 minutes ago before i even just said that i'm not buying there but i did buy there when the market was smashed um extend the job keeper that is what's going to happen. He's extending the, um, <laughs> the job keeper. Alex, I hope you're doing well. Christmas with the banks. Yeah, it's interesting. Free labor during summer. Uh, hey, man. Hey, Michael. Hope you're doing well. Um, hope you're doing well, mate. And uh, from our chat last week, I remember our chat. I hope you're doing well, mate. Um, uh, hey, is, is there any way to get access to the video of the webinar as I will not be able to watch it uh, for the night? Yes, um, if you register for the webinar, uh, we have a webinar tomorrow evening. Um, it is very important that you get on the webinar. Um, there is only 500 spots on there and I think that they're almost um, filled out, the, the, the whole 500 spots. So if you haven't registered for the webinar tomorrow night, uh, you can try by the link. Um, if you can't get on to the webinar, um, email my office at admin at beinvestor.com.au and they may send you a copy of the webinar after the event. Um, it's not going to be publicised on Facebook or, or um, YouTube or anything like that. So you must register for the webinar. If you haven't registered for the webinar, go register for the webinar. Um, if you can't make it, uh, make sure you email my team and say, look, I'd like to register. You won't allow me to register or I won't be able to make it and they'll be able to send you a copy of it. So it's, it's going to be an invite only. So um, Cosmo, yeah, um, if you want to do that, that'd be great. Rod, how do you know uh, you have too much debt for hyperinflation? Good point. Um, you know, some people that are too over leveraged or too under leveraged. Um, too under leveraged, no debt, too much cash in the bank just waiting for an opportunity, waiting for the right day. Um, you know, two over leverage is people that have got, you know, uh, uh, a mortgage, they've used a house as an ATM, they've mortgaged themselves up with eyeballs, right? I've got eight and a half mil worth of debt, I'm the most happiest fucking guy alive right now. Um, and I haven't even put one of my mortgage, not even one of them have I put on hold during this time personally, um, because I'd like to see the terms and conditions of what they are offering out there, right? I'd like to be one of those legacy people that haven't taken up that because there might be benefits for not putting a loan on pause for the last six months. Um, but people that are over leveraged are the ones that have got, you know, not enough cash flow. Cash flow is really, really crucial. Um, I took my cash flow plates off my Bentley. I did sell my Bentley a couple of years ago, guys, and uh, I put them on hold and I just bought a new vehicle. Now the plate's going back on them uh, this week. It's more appropriate because it's a, a workable vehicle, not a, um, you know, a, a, a top-end vehicle. Um, cash flow. I got that cash flow number plate on a blue Ford Falcon. It was my first car that I had it on. Um, and it was just a Ford Falcon with double plate cash flow. Um, cash flow is the most important thing uh, during this period of time. Having money coming into your bank account and you being able to use that money for whatever you want it to be. I keep calling it money just because most people are referencing money as money, but it's actually just a currency. I want to get that the currency flowing into my bank account and being able to purchase and acquire new assets and you know be able to live from that. So um, you know a lot of people are stretched very thinly. And to say a half a million dollars is too much, a million dollars is too much, right? As I said, 18 and a half million dollars and I don't even feel it because the cash flow was reoccurring. 
Um, those that are too far stretched beyond their budget, beyond their means, they know who they are, right? Those people are the ones that have got five car repayments, they've got credit cards, they've got afterpay. Um, you know, if you're doing afterpay, you know, reconsider your spending habits, right? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to offend anybody here. Um, apologies if I do. Uh, not really sorry, because I'm trying to help you get a better sort of mindset of, upon it. Uh, the people that are using afterpay, I went and bought jeans the other week. I fucking hate getting clothes. That's why I try and just keep the same sort of outfit and know the brands and whatever I'm buying and just you know, put them on. Um, but I tried these pants on and in the back of the change room doors, because you can't afford it, afterpay. I'm like, you can't afford fucking $50 pair of jeans, a $100 pair of jeans, a fucking $50 shirt, whatever it is. Don't buy a shirt, right? But there's people that have got afterpay for this, afterpay for that, right? And these, you know, that is possibly uh, over leveraging and over stretching yourself, right? Having debt that's bringing in cash flow, debt that's building up your net worth position, um, you know, or people that are just stuck in a debt rut and just have to get debt for everything. Um, that's, you know, when you're too over leveraged. So it's not a matter of how much debt. If I could have a billion dollars worth of debt and I could have, you know, a half, a half a billion dollars a year cash flow coming through, well, then the billion dollars worth of debt's nothing because the cash flow is coming through is going to uh, cover the costs of, of holding that. So, yeah, um, that's just my, my, two, my, my two cents on it. Got tongue twisted. Um, Mark, we are losing value in the AUD to gold at a decent rate. We need to be diversified, i.e. Uh, US assets, gold as a hedge. I was watching some Mike Maloney videos uh, that had come up with suggested videos and they were from nine years ago. And um, the, um, the, um, I just had someone message me. I got your message that came through. You know who you were that sent me the message about after pages and I saw it pop up on my phone. Um, Mike Maloney was saying the same thing. Now, nine years ago, 10 years ago, oh, property prices are gonna fall. Um, you know, gold by gold by silver, um, whatnot, right? And there was a massive property boom that occurred 10 years ago, as we all know. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are talking buy gold, buy silver, uh, all that. I think it's important to look at your position and go, okay, what do I have as a hedge? This is my bottle cap. Um, what do I have as a hedge? What do I have as a ballast to navigate through different markets and changing times? Um, you know, I personally own a lot of precious metals. I own a lot of cryptocurrencies. I own a lot of different businesses and uh, different other sort of financial instruments to have access to liquidity of things do take a turn and I need to get access to that. Um, so it's important to work out an overall picture and like sort of financial roadmap as to where are you heading, where are you at, um, what steps you need to take, uh, what assets. There's some people there that I'm like, don't buy any more property. You've got too many properties, sell off a couple of properties potentially. Uh, maybe buy more property, maybe buy some cryptocurrency, maybe not buy some cryptocurrency maybe buy some precious metals. Um, only you know your position, but you've got to work out what is that going to add to your bottom line? Like what do you need today? What do you need for the other end of the system? Do you have a lot of metal? Do you have a lot of crypto? I know people that have got all in on crypto and the markets go like this and they've got like, you know, uh, anxiety to the max, right? Uh, I know people that have just got all property and that's cool too. Um, I know people that dabble into a little bit of, you know, these these other areas that they've never ventured into before. And, you know, I don't think people should go and speculate and go, I'm going to buy, you know, become an expert of this and an expert of that. I think it's important to go, okay, you know, have I fulfilled the goals in this segment of my portfolio? Have I got, you know, my property goals? Have I got my share portfolio? Have I got my cash? Have I got, you know, what is your position looking like? So. But you were right, uh, we are losing value in the Aussie dollar at the moment. Uh, I believe that we will see a loss in the US dollar at some point along the track. Um, but it appears that if we keep going on the same trajectory as we are, we're seeing globally the US dollar is tearing ahead um, as the other currencies are, are falling behind. And 
you know, looking at economic models, right, it's, it's hard to tell the levers that are being pulled whether the Aussie dollar will die, whether the Canadian dollar will die, whether the euro will die. I reckon the euro will die in the next decade, completely gone. Uh, will the Aussie dollar survive? Probably, but it will be a different format uh, of how it is. Um, yeah, so very interesting. Keep an eye on the currency conversion rates. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, look at it every day, but, you know, take screenshots. Like I have so many screenshots. My biggest folder in my phone um, is screenshots. So take screenshots of, all different markets, uh, take it of the 30 day in the bank chain trade, take it of um, yield curves in the US, take it of the Dow Jones, take it of all different um, bond curves. And um, yeah, it's, it's important just to have a reference point. So remember on this day, something had occurred, this is what the glitch was and being able to go back to it. So I try and um, you know share some of that stuff. I don't want to bore everyone in Birch feed, but I do share some of that geeky sort of uh, stats as well. Um, hate the shops. Yes, I hate the shops. Uh, money printing suggests devalued currencies and more money to buy assets. But banks are tighter, higher unemployment, and closed borders reducing population growth. Uh, this suggests uh, not the property boom that's being suggested. Comments. Good question, uh, Matt. Um, yeah, so if there's no people coming into the country, then how can we you know, grow our population? Um, bringing people into the country, still people migrating here. Right? There's people that are that I know that are trying to get into the country. There's people. There's actual incentives in different locations um, to have migration occur. So, uh, if we look back in uh, 2008, 2009, there was some uh, you know incentives for people to come to Australia. Uh, those incentives are probably double what they were back in 2008, 2009. I'm not going to go into it into too much detail. Um, however, there is some massive, massive incentives. I've talked about that with my uh, clients that I work with one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you know, it's part of my IP, um, intellectual property. I, uh, I don't kind of just throw it all around out there. Um, but yeah, with it, there is strong immigration out there. Don't be fooled by that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, you know pent-up demand. Just because we haven't got the borders open today doesn't mean in 12 months' time, 24 months' time, that people won't want to come here. And it doesn't mean that you know every other country that's annoyed with their government or the way that they were handled throughout this time or whatever, uh, like, stuff this, I'm leaving my country, I'm coming to Australia, you know, let's move here, let's make a new life for ourselves. Um, there, there's a very... Uh, strong crowd of those people as well that want to come here. So I'm just noticing over here on Instagram, we're going to lose a lot of, uh, shortly this is going to drop out for our one hour. So I'm going to just read a couple of questions in here and just to share the love. Uh, Birchie, what's cracking? Sorry, I've been slack on the paperwork. That's cool, mate, when you're ready. Back into resource towns. No, um, I buy anywhere, whenever. But um, yeah, I, I, I purchase all around the country. Uh, is a Perth Mint, the best uh, to buy gold. I have bought from them. It uh, doesn't mean that I like buying from them. Uh, just remembering that they're a government, they hold the crest of the Australian logo. Um, so yeah, with it, they will know what they've sent you. Uh, every time I've taken a delivery has been to someone else. <laughs> so they don't like people knowing where, what, how, all that sort of stuff. Um, there is other bullion dealers out there. Um, I used to buy from a bullion dealer over in Perth, but they, um, closed down about a year ago um, and uh, I think I may have found them. There's another bullion dealer which looks very similar to them over there. There's also um, you know, ABC Bullion. Um, there's a lot of reputable bullion companies out there uh, where you can buy gold and silver. But there is a lot of, uh, there is a lack of uh, physical supply. I found a pen on the tiles. Um, there is a lack of physical um, metal out there to be delivered. So it doesn't mean that there's a shortage of it, it just means that there's a lack of uh, stock because of high demand at the moment and some of the, the mines and processing times have been delayed. So don't get caught up in the fact that no one's got it, it's gonna, it's gonna boom in, in price because uh, it's all controlled on the paper markets uh, by the COMEX. So, um, and all the contracts there. Um, what's up, Nathan, watching? Uh, you love the cases? Yes, I find it very amusing that uh, 33, 33, 33, 33. It's a very important number uh, in the world to some people. Uh, Nathan, when are you going to grow a mullet? Uh, I haven't got a mullet at the moment. 
But um, I did have a mullet back in about 2010. Uh, I have had it a few times, not just the V-shaped one. I had like the full-on mullet. Uh, it's pretty cool. I thought it would get the chicks. But they don't like it so much, I've been told. But I do. I would grow the mullet if I could be bothered. But uh, you know, business at the front, party at the back. <laughs> Thanks for your time today. Pleasure, Bob. Um, I need a job. Let's look for jobs. Let's look for opportunity, guys. I think this time is more so than any other time in, in history. Right? If you know someone that's been laid off, if you, you we're seeing it, we're physically seeing it. Um, you know, where people are losing their jobs, losing their source of income, getting themselves in a lot more debt uh, just to stay alive, to feed the family, to keep a roof over their head, and, and all that sort of stuff. It's more important than ever to have multiple streams of income, whether it be you know building out that side hustle, right? Like people ask me regularly, uh, Nathan, what well, should I get in the business? I was like, well. You know, don't quit your job and start a business, but if you can start something, like it might take an extra few hours of an evening. I'm not going to go Gary V on everybody and start fucking revving you up and, and, and saying, fucking do it, you know. But, um, you know, how much does it cost to set up a business? How much does it cost to set up a Facebook page? How much does it cost to build a website? How much does it cost to um, set up an Amazon store, right? People saying, oh, should I, th I'm thinking of doing an Amazon store. It's like, it costs you like fucking 20 bucks or something. Just go do it, right? And then you go, well, I've got this Amazon store, I'm invested, I put $20 into it. Now I need to get some products, right? That's the next step that you need to do. So take action, like build, look, research, find, try and, you know, educate yourself and, and build multiple streams of income. For me, it's property, it's business, it's, investing in other sort of financial instruments, um, some tech plays as well. Um, but yeah, try and build more than one income stream. So that's, that's what's important. And it, it, it's been very obvious, very obvious. That's the first time I've said it since when uh, Corona started is that you should be looking at this point in time going, fuck, like you know, people have literally devoted their whole life to hop on a train or a bus, go to work, um, have the ships with their job and then devout their life to their job and then the next minute they suddenly don't have a job and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, but hurry up and get my documents done. <laughs> Sooner the better the market is moving out there. So, um, how do you get a loan when you have a part-time job of 18 and have 70 grand to work with? I should reach out to my office, man. I'll reach out to my office. Um, I know people that are on part-time that do get loans, uh, you know, getting a loan for the first property, you know, depending on what a part-time rate is, right? Like I've seen people on 20 grand a year get a property. I've seen people on 30 grand a year get a property. I've seen people on 40 grand get a property. A lot of people on 40 grand get properties. 50 grand, very much so you can get properties. So, you know, important to get the right team around you. Uh, if you need help with that, I do, um, run a, a large-scale finance company, and we help people, you know, work out a, a debt strategy to accumulate uh, assets on that front. So, 70 grand—that's really cool, right? Like 18 saves up 70 grand. If you can do it, a lot of other people watching this video should be doing it. May not be doing it. I'm not saying everyone's got the same position or opportunities, but good work, man. Good work. Um, I see that Instagram is going to die off and I'm going to have to get another uh, live stream going in a moment. But um, yeah, I've gone through the question. So when that turns off, I'm going to go back to Facebook. I'm going to start another live and get back to you guys in a moment. Uh, the reason why it dies over there on Instagram is it only lasts for an hour. I've gone over the hour time frame. Um, Sam, would you uh, only lease to Aussie permanent residents and citizens, tenants, seeing that they are only ones that can get government benefits, high risk, in my opinion, leasing to non-PR citizens as a uh, as six-month rent eviction freeze is still in place. What is your thoughts on squatter, scatter, gun approach, 9 eg Submit 100 lowball offers. Um, I think the 9 may have been a full stop or something there. Um, Submit 800 lowball offers on properties and hope to get one or two accepted. Uh, any updates with organized helicopter? $130 group on ride. Just going to make sure Fonda Fondler does not come. Well, it would be fun to do the helicopter ride. So uh, I'll leave that with you, Sam, if you want to organize that. Um, I suppose I can uh, come along 
at some point for a helicopter ride. Um, with um, your question regarding permanent residents, uh, Australian citizens, etc., ones that can get JobKeeper benefits, um, I haven't made any personal references on that. Um, I don't. You know, it's interesting that you point that out. However, you know the type of properties that I'm playing with, they're not you know thousand dollar a week rents. Some of them are, but they're not all at that sort of um, level. I'm just going to do another live here for our friends on Instagram. Um, yeah, I'm personally leasing properties on my own to you know Aussies or permanent residents or citizens uh, to um, people on visas and whatnot. Um, yeah, I've got no issues with that. Uh, ultimately, you want to make sure that you've got all your insurances in place, you've done all your checks, you've got everything sort of uh, in line and kosher to be able to um, get, take an insurance claim should you need to and take the appropriate steps to be able to do that. And the six month ban that's on at the moment, will that occur, will that be here in another three months? Right, we're already three months into that six month ban. Just remember that guys, the six month uh, rule of not being able to kick out a, a tenant, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if we're three months into that, well, there's only three months left potentially on that on that note. Um, what is my thoughts on the scattergun approach? So putting offers, 100 offers each week on the properties. Um, I have specific requirements. Uh, I don't go and waste my time by putting low offers because time is energy, energy is important, time is important. Um, I could be doing better things with my offers. So I spend a lot of time uh, researching, understanding areas. I know areas that I've never even been to off the back of my hand, just using technology um, in every randomest, most corner of this country. So you tell me suburbs, I'll be like, I know that place. I've been there virtually. Um, so when I'm putting offers in on properties, a lot of the time it's via relationships that I've built over the years, uh, networking with agents and whatnot. Um, but if I'm looking for properties out there, if the property's you know, 300,000, I'm offering 150, I'd never do that because it's just wasting everybody's time. Um, if the owner has placed the property on the market for 300 and offering 150, it's wasting my time, the owner's a dickhead. Um, I'd rather work with good people in order to get the results. Um, so I know what I'm looking for. I, I spend probably about three hours a day still trailing um, the internet just for any corner that may have been missed or I've got about 100 different search results that are saved in my um, search bars and I have to go through every single property. I literally physically go through all of them and I've got processes and systems and procedures in place in order to uh, be on top of all my offers. So I could have hundreds, like literally like 500, 800, 1,000 offers out at any one point in time. I've actually um, got a spreadsheet system that works to keep on top of all my offers to see you know, what the property was first listed for, what it's you know, being offered for at the moment, where my offers out, what the agent's feedback was, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, I don't just go and scatter offers everywhere. Uh, what would you do with 200 grand offset against a principal place of residence? Uh, good question, Judy. Um, just being really clear to everybody here, now that we've got people back on Instagram, uh, I'm not your financial advisor. This isn't financial advice, and uh, I can't give you financial advice on that front. Uh, but if you're asking me, and we're just down at the pub, and this was a you know, bottle of scotch, having a, a drink out of it, a few mates down at the bar, what would I do with 200 grand? I would probably use that as four deposits at fifty thousand dollars on a two hundred grand property, and accumulate eight hundred grand worth of asset. An average rent of say three hundred bucks a week. Um, that would be twelve hundred dollars a week return. Uh, there's fifty uh, odd grand a year, uh, sixty grand a year. Sorry, sixty-two thousand dollars a year uh, in rent return. And I would use um, those assets, like in the view that if I'm picking up, you know, four properties for two hundred grand a piece. And they're worth 250k a piece. Then I'm picking up 800 a uh, million dollars worth of asset for 800,000. I've got cash flow um, of 60 grand a year coming through to look after itself, and then hopefully go back to those existing four properties that I've just secured and try and pull some equity out to go buy another four. So that is what I would do personally. But I'm not everybody here that's watching me. 
and everybody's position is different. So um, if you'd like to go and explore different options, please do feel free to reach out to myself and my team, um, flick us a private message, um, send us an email at admin at beinvested.com.au. So it's just admin at beinvested.com.au for everybody here. So you've got some time to write it down. Um, and uh, reach out to my team. And you know, this is what I specialize in every day of the week is helping people build you know, wealth in, in property and, and assets and uh, financial instruments. So um, I do talk about some crazy stuff and uh, that's why I have fun with doing this. Why, you know, I get so pumped up on a Tuesday night for everyone. But you know, what I specialize in uh, every day of the week. Um, next, this Friday, hopefully, this Friday, hopefully, maybe on Friday afternoon, I rarely, rarely drink. And I plan on having an investor come into the office, if he's watching, he knows who he is, um, to draw up on the whiteboard what we recently did for him because it was really amazing. It's a really amazing story. One of my best and coolest scenarios that I've ever seen with anybody and half of the people here that are watching and in the community could do the same thing. And basically they got from two properties to almost 10 properties in a month and um, owning the house outright. So it's just a restructure of a portfolio. So everybody's position is different. You could be starting out like a shoe over there on, uh, on Instagram, um, you could be, you know, having a principal place with an offset, um, or could have a half a portfolio wanting to build a full portfolio, could have a full portfolio wanting to, you know, restructure. And that's sort of what I work with my uh, investors with in sort of like a, a family office style environment, um, being open and caring with everyone. So happy to help out Judy if I can, but that's what I would be doing with initial thoughts, without knowing too many other finer details of, of, of a position as just myself. Uh, Josh, Bircho, single income, pros and cons of going at halves with a friend in a property. Would it be slow, faster, uh, or just the same to acquire a significant portfolio? Very important, Josh. If you are thinking of buying a property halves with someone, you need to be on the webinar tomorrow night. There will not be the webinar will not be shared here with anyone. It will not be on Instagram, it will not be on Facebook, it will not be on YouTube. It's specifically the people that come to the webinar. If you don't have access to the webinar, it may be full at capacity because it only allow 500 people in there. Email my team at admin at beinvested.com.au and they'll sort something out to get you uh, access to that webinar. Um, would I go harsh with anyone in the property? No, 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 no. That's my personal view. Uh, the reason why I would have, let's just assume we're two mates down at the, the pub, Josh, we have a few drinks, and um, you know, we go, let's go have a great idea, let's go buy a property. You can borrow a half a million dollars, I can buy, buy a half a million dollars, you know, we can go buy half a million dollar properties. We have some great ideas, we go, shit, we're gonna go on. 50-50 in a property, we go put the deposit together, we might put 50 grand each, and go just go buy this half million dollar property. When we go to the bank, the bank's gonna calculate me for 100% of the debt, they're gonna calculate you for 100% of the debt. So where well, you could personally go and buy yourself a half mil property, and I could go buy myself a half mil property, we would then control a million dollars worth of property, then only, you know, that would be the case, right? If we were to go halves on that property, then the bank would take my serviceability and your serviceability, and we would be shit out of luck to get anything else. So uh, whenever I see someone that's gone halves on the property with someone, I'm like, fuck, like you've just really messed up your finance position. So before you do anything, if you are thinking of you know, buying a property, important to find out what your finance position is like. Um, there is other you know, things to consider. Water for those of you that are thinking I've got vodka in my bottle, I'll just open it up. Um, yeah, with it, um, it would hold you back. It would hold someone back to be able to do that. So no financial advice, you need to speak to the right team of people. Um, I have the people that you could speak to, so hit, hit us up, um, happy to help out. The other thing to consider, I've seen this happen beforehand, is that you could have two mates now uh, their mates when they're 25, going out, 
get them blind, pick up some chicks, all sounds cool. And then when they're 30, they might have two different lifestyles, right? They may not even like each other, they're not mates anymore. Um, they One might get married and one may want to keep traveling and partying. You've got two different lifestyles. The one that's traveling and partying may want the cash, the one that wants to settle down may not have the cash and wants to hold on to the asset. It could bring like rifts in front of um, family members or whatever, if you go in the house with a family member. Uh, you could have a parent um, and a child. The child may want to hold on to the asset. The parent may want to, um, you know, to dispose of the assets so they can retire or reduce debt or whatever the case may be. And it, you know, the goals aren't always aligned. So personally, I don't own any properties with anybody. I've owned maybe less than I can count on a hand properties. Um, and it's always been just because I couldn't finance it. So I've used someone else's servicing or whatever. And I'll say, here's the cash, let's go half some of the deal and, and, and done it that way. Um, Josh also asked, how do you figure um, if an older suburb has upside for growth, if it's already fully established, comparing to a new location that has new subdivisions and knockdown rebuild scenarios. Pierce, I'm looking uh, in working class suburbs. Uh, love your work, keep it up, uh, keep, keep it stiff. Try to. Um, with it, look, every area is different. Then look at the demographic of what does the area involve, right? Like, how. Um, What's the income going to support? I actually asked someone this last night uh, on a map session. I was like, what would the area um, look like? Like, how could an area double? What's the average income in the area, right? It doesn't matter if it's new or old. Like, there's so many older suburbs that go up so much higher than uh, these newer Greenfield because with a new Greenfield estate, let's say you've got an estate that's three years old and you've got an estate that's new, uh, for the same price difference, someone would go for a new property over the old property. So. Um, I, I don't take that into consideration. Like, um, you need to look at like for like in certain markets. And I don't think that a greenfield site will go up higher than an established site. I don't think an established site will go up higher than an infill site. Um, the greenfield site, the um, the newer estates that are out there, um, generally like, there's a lot of you know overcapitalized. Like people are wanting to pay more because they're glossy and all that, it's new and all that sort of stuff. So the growth may not be so great in those areas. Um, yep, my parents just got uh, locked in their house in Melbourne, back in lockdown for a month at least, it's crazy. Uh, I've got some mates that are here in Sydney at the moment uh, from Melbourne and um, they're going back. And so why do you want to go to the Communist Party of Victoria? So yeah, it's... Um, it's interesting. Dave, the currency is cooked. The whole system's cooked. The whole system's cooked. Um, but you're right, the currency's screwed. Matt, uh, hi again, Nathan. Keen to book in a map session with you. When are you booked up to? I'm not too sure. You need to check out with my office, Matt. Um, I look forward to chatting with you and, and helping you. Um, for those of you that don't know, map session is a, a, com like a conversation with yourself, work out a strategy, work out you know where you are, where you're trying to go what we need to do to help get you there, uh, what opportunities there are, all that sort of stuff. Basically, spending an hour with Virtue. So, um, yeah, um, I don't know. But you'd have to check with my office. Like, it is booked up for, like, months in advance. Um, however, there is, like, points where people, you know, fall off. They, they can't attend to their appointment. Something comes up, comes up or whatever. So there could be possibility of getting something in the in the next month or six weeks or so. So, um, but yeah, just reach out to the office um, and, and, and they'll book it in. I look forward to chatting to you soon, Matt. Um, Jay, uh, bail in, thoughts on keeping liquidity. Um, they could bail in. What you've got to remember, guys, is that when you have your money, in a bank or with your currency in a bank, right? Try and get your currency out. Try and get your money out of the bank, right? They give you a million questions, they can't get it, etc., etc. Um, the money is stuck in the bank. It's not your money. You are accredited to the bank. If the bank folded up, you would be standing in line with all the other creditors in order to uh, get a percentage of whatever's left over for you to, 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 to get your money back. So uh, personally, I've always got my money out there working. I've out there hustling and uh, trying to work on my next deal. I don't want to have money in the bank. I'm all about the cash flow. So I try and get the cash flow in. I go and dump it into new assets. It generates more cash flow, more cash flow comes next month. I take that cash flow, I go buy more assets. 
Um, and it's not always about buying the assets. Sometimes it's improving assets. It's you know improving the position. So yeah, I'll try and get that cash out as quick as it goes in the bank account. Uh, Daniel, uh, when would rates go negative? Uh, would it be at the end of this year? Would the RBA stay true to the word uh, of at least two years at no change? <laughs> the RBA, you can't trust them for shit. You can't trust the RBA for anything. They said the interest rates were gonna be moving up. They said monetary policy will be heading up, not down. Next minute, about like three months later, interest rates went down and they've come down um, about 500% since they said that statement within 12 months. Um, I predicted that by the end of this financial year, i.e. tomorrow, that we would see negative interest rates. Uh, based on everything that had occurred previously for me to be able to prognosticate uh, interest rates in the future, and the, the monetary policy in the future, uh, over the course of the last decade, indicated that would have occurred. Um, however, all the parameters are off the, the fundamentals are off the table due to the level of manipulation in the money supply out there at the moment. So um, technically we should be, um, the cash rate, the real cash rate is uh, 0%, uh, but we have to put something in there so it's at 25 basis points at the RBA at the moment. Um, and, you know, can they let it go negative? They very much well can. Uh, about six months ago, I think it was around September when, uh, when the repo market started, maybe October, November last year, I actually did a Facebook Live talking about um, the, uh, the, the the back end of the computers at the banks, they're not set up. It's like the Y2K, the Y2K uh, problem uh, where the, the banks aren't actually set up to take on negative interest rates at the moment. So we are ultimately going to head to negative interest rates. I am confident that we'll see negative interest rates. We cannot, when, now we're printing all this currency and we've got all this debt being created, um, how are we going to pay it back? If there's ever a chance to pay it back, it would be by making interest rates negative, but keeping monetary policy very tight. So there's not an influx of liquidity being created, i.e. creating massive inflation, and trying to you know, make that, that, that capital eat itself. So um, yeah, the question is, like, I, I, I see people ask sometimes, you know, would, uh, should I invest in a government bond, a government bond or a bond? The bonds are the worst thing. Who want to have a negative yielding bond or a bond like put a hundred grand down now, you might get a hundred and two thousand dollars back in 2030, but you've got your money tied up for a decade and you're getting nothing back on it apart from a hundred grand that can't buy you what it can today. So um, it's a very interesting time, very interesting time. Um, Tommy, uh, how you doing bro? Uh, my neighbor Carlos is here with me again. Hey Carlos. Um, um, uh, he showed me the lame street media. Yep, I uh, reported today that rental properties are empty and rents are reducing by up to 40% due to lack of international students and job losses, creating a nightmare for landlords. He wants to know if this will start uh, be short term or long term pain. I remember back my first uh, rental property, which was in Western Sydney back in 2003. Uh, I thought, you know, I want to be a property investor, real estate agent seemed cool, I want to be a real estate agent, and my first job was out in property management in, uh, in Western Sydney. And um, at the time, like, properties were sitting vacant for like three months, four months, you had to give like one week, two week, three week rent for free uh, to try and lease these things. And I mean like a brand new unit that rent for 180 bucks a week with, you know, sit there for months. Um, the thing is, is that, yeah, you know, that was short term, right? By 2006, 2007, the rents were at like 350 bucks a week. So whatever we're seeing at the moment, that's the opportunity, right? Like the opportunity, you can look at it and be like, oh, things are really bad or whatever. There could be a few people hurting. That's the opportunity, you go and slap around. You drop the rent a little bit, there's always gonna be a person to move into something at the right price. I think in some areas, which the, the lamestream media may be commenting on there, which, is that, you know, in a city, in a specific suburb, um, and when I'm saying these suburbs, like I've got some mates that live in Chinatown and in, in Haymarket and whatnot, and they have other properties that they lease out by Airbnb, right? And those properties, no one's renting properties for Airbnb, they're all shit scared at the moment. So those properties has been an oversupply, but they're all being dumped on the market at the moment, and there's a lot of fear out there, um, yeah, it, it could cause a, a short term, it's not a long term trend, right? Once 
Now people feel confident again once people start coming. It could be 12 months time. There may be a shortage of um, you know, Airbnbs out there. So people may be starting to rent these things out again and doing all that. So that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> I don't do that, I don't like it. Um, but that's the opportunity, right? Like the, the, at the, currently, the banks are saying, look, don't have to pay your mortgage. You can put it on hold if you're struggling. Uh, that could be extended for another six months or 12 months. Interest rates are being held low. They're not dropping interest rates to a fucking quarter of a percent um, due to the fact that, you know, we just want to drop it so everyone can have a, a good old time and have money. They're dropping it due to pressures in the marketplace. And it's important to find opportunity. And you know what I'm talking about, Tommy, with like some properties you could pick up for like 155000 They rent for 300 bucks a week. Um, those markets aren't going to cop that same effect. So the market is making it a change for the whole market, but some markets will severely benefit. Um, and they're the markets that I'm interested in. There are opportunities, like if I was looking to spend a million dollars on a property, and I went to go buy one of those units, and you know I could have a bit of extra kick in, you know, kicking the owner while they're down or whatever, um, the opportunity could be there too. So just depending on what your strategy is, um, but I'm loving it out there. And I, from the types of rentals that you know we've been playing with, um, I haven't seen any sort of downfall in that type of space at this point in time. And, and you know, I'm excited by that, so it's great. Um, uh, don't they want the loss for personal income tax purposes? I'm not too sure what you mean by that, Chris. Uh, apologies, mate, but I think it was, I read a message here from 40 minutes ago. Um, Corey, where do you see the Aussie dollar going down or up in the next year or so? Very good question. I actually don't like commenting on the Aussie dollar uh, because there's too many variables, right? A lot of people ask me, Nathan, why don't you go and invest in the US or invest in another country? Um, when you're investing in a different country, you're not just investing into, oh, I've got a property in Sydney and I've got a property in New York or a property in China or in America or wherever. You're investing in their law system, their finance system, their structuring, um, the, the tax system, um, most importantly, you're hedging a currency. So let's say, for example, someone has a property in the US and the dollar goes down by half, but the property goes up. You could technically see your property double, but it could be worth the same amount in the local currency. So you're hedging certain things. Um, there are too many variables to, you know, Commentate on that, right? At this point in time, Australia is staying pretty strong. If we print off lots more money, um, we could uh, see a dollar fall. And if we don't print off much more money and the US gets itself into trouble, we could see the US dollar uh, slide against the Aussie dollar, pushing the Aussie dollar up. So um, there's always a question, right? Is it the Aussie dollar going up or is it the US dollar dying? Right? There's the other side of the coin because there's two sides to any coin obviously but um i don't like to comment on that i think we're going to see a very choppy ride uh, my thoughts would be is that would stay within a band range sometimes we'll see it drop real low um i sometimes have to pay people in other currencies for certain services or whatever uh, throughout my businesses um, and when i pay them and they send their bill on I'm like a few couple of months ago when everything turned to shit for everyone i was like sitting there going, this is a strange right has dropped like 5%, right? And 5% on uh, you know, a large amount of like 10 grand or something like that, it, it adds up. And it's like, fuck, that was more expensive, right? The person on the other end ain't receiving any more money. It's just costing me more money in our local currency here. So um, yeah, there's something to, to watch out for. But we quickly saw that turn around um, with you know, the US changing their monetary policy in the back end as well. Um, Chris Morales to buy after, uh, after pay shares, not payment plans. <laughs> exactly. Um, we've all seen what's happened to after pay, um, and what's happened to, uh, other, um, sort of companies that are like it. Are we going to see every company go up like that? Right. We've seen MySpace and Facebook. We've seen Google and Alta Vista back in the nineties. Um, you know, there is opportunities out there. Um, Wish I bought some, but be interested to see if they'll crash in years to come. Good point, Josh. Hope you're doing well, bro. 
Um, imagine buying Afterpay shares with Afterpay. That would be pretty funny. Um, loving it. Thanks, Keith. Uh, wow. Well, um, do you live, uh, do a live on that, mate? Friday sounds amazing. Well done to the investor. It's a really cool story, right? That the story I told you guys about beforehand, um, it's not 100% locked in um, that, that I'm going to be able to do that. But if I do, I'll let you guys know pre prior. Um, it is really my most favorite deal. Like it is the most, it's not a deal per se, it's a structure. It's been the most favorite transaction I've ever done. I will remember that forever. Um, and I had a lot of help from the team to be able to pull it off. It was basically changing a car's engine whilst the car is driving down the freeway is what uh, we were able to do for this client. So um, he's got a really cool story. So I look forward to you know, sharing with you guys um, what, um, what his journey was with that because it's a really cool strategy. Um, Steve, hope you're doing well, mate. Um, if going halves is so bad, then why does it work for a marriage couple or de facto? Are the rules different for those situations? Correct. Um, so when we were talking beforehand about you know the, 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 the problem with going halves with someone, um, if you're in a marriage situation, uh, you may be using two sets of income to service for the debt anyway. So it depends how the loan is structured. Uh, so you could buy two independent portfolios or you could buy one together um, but generally they you know sort of halving your expenses and all that sort of stuff so um, yeah it depends on the situation and how it's structured um, but yeah with it I see uh, couples which um, I'm like can't you know let's say for instance you've got a block of four units four units would be commercial but if someone bought two and another person bought two Technically, that, that could possibly go through. However, if we um, if you have the the two people buying the four properties, it wouldn't go through. But to buy them separately, you can't do that. Um, just due to the fact that I feel like I'm sign language here. Um, due to the fact that they might need the bank might need to take both servicing for both applications. So sometimes the servicing is needed. It's more of a technical question on that front, um, and that would be the importance of tomorrow night's webinar. Um, so if you're going to be there uh, on the webinar, um, it would be a very good question to ask Rose tomorrow night. Uh, it's going to be a webinar tomorrow night on financing and structuring. Everybody has to register for that. Uh, flick an email to admin at beinvested.com.au because the registration I think is maxed out um, and they'll be able to get you access to uh, the webinar. But um, obviously on that example, you know, there's many variables and no financial advice to everyone, but yeah. Um, Justin, uh, everyone says pull out equity of properties. Unfortunately, your banks uh, want to know what you can service uh, the equity pulled out based on wage, even if you want to buy a property and expand. Correct. Um, but there becomes a point, right? I know a lot of people that two years ago couldn't service due to the fact that the bank's servicing, like for example, the big four were basing servicing on 7.25% interest rates. And now that it's gone down, to, I don't know what it's like, five and a half, let's call it. Right, um, they may not have serviced beforehand on the back end calculator, but they may service now. If interest rates keep going down, the barrier of entry to get into finance becomes easier. Um, you could see, you know, a lot more people that couldn't service that want to service and want to buy be able to get back into the market. So uh, don't don't think it's all over um, until you know things things do change. Right, the lower the interest rates go, uh, at negative interest rates, everybody can uh, can afford property. Um, I know that people will probably, haters will probably see this and cut little segments out, but yeah. Uh, Amanda, buying property ownership structure, private name, could you talk about? Um, it's different for everybody. Um, it's probably more of an accountant sort of question. Um, I see a lot of people that build larger property portfolios do buy them under their personal name. Like when you're buying them under a trust, there's a lot of tax benefits that get trapped inside that trust. Um, you create new taxes like land taxes if you let's say for instance someone doesn't own any property they're buying in sydney and they're buying it under a trust they're going to pay land tax now from day dot if you're buying on a new person then you get a land tax free threshold so there's pros and cons to put under a trust or not um, and it's more of a structuring advice uh, more of a structuring question 
for a, an accountant and a financial advisor and a lawyer. So, uh, Amanda, I can put you in contact with the right people to hone in on those questions, um, but it's everybody's position is different. Um, yeah, so I see a lot of the best investors out there uh, by their first sort of five, 10, 15 under their personal names, but that's not me giving advice, that's just an observation uh, out there in the market. So if you'd like, send an email over, send a DM, and I'll get someone to actually answer that one-on-one -on -one with you uh, and, and, and call out, even if it's just a chat with uh, Ridwan, just do remember, if you guys wanna to chat to Ridwan, that it is the start of the new tax season. Uh, tomorrow is July 1st. Everyone wants to get tax return done. Um, so he will be very busy for the next couple of months. Um, but I'll make sure if you want to have a chat that I can put you in contact with him. Um, Amanda, could you talk about buying uh, property um, to build a duplex comparing older established areas compared to a new estate? Um, it just depends on, there's many variables, there's many variables. On the same chat, let's take that one offline and, and, and look at the, the pros and cons of that as well. But um, there is, you know, if you're buying, there's many variables, right? So um, what are you trying to achieve? The question you need to be asking yourself is what are you trying to achieve out of doing that? Like, are you gonna be buying it to sell, make a profit, take that profit and reinvest it? Are you trying to buy it build it, pull out equity? Are you just trying to do it for the sake of doing a, 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 a development? I've seen people that have done uh, builds and a couple of years ago, all of you may remember, um, I've got a lot of bulk land cheap and we did a lot of builds and duplexes and stuff like that. Um, in hindsight, a lot of people are like, you know, it locked me out of the market for 12 months, 24 months. So I've got a good result. I made 100 grand or 200 grand or whatever the case may be. Um, however, you know, I could have done other stuff. And I like to remind them that, you know, I'm happy that they made a couple of hundred grand when the property market was going like this, um, but the locking themselves out of the market in a boom, it may be not advantageous. So I guess your overall strategy should be more, what is the bigger picture and how is that duplex or the build gonna help you get to your end goal? So um, this is something that I talk a lot about in map sessions with people, and I'll just touch on it very, you know, loosely, um, is that you need to always question yourself, this decision that I'm gonna make now, right? Whether it be an acquisition, whether it be a tax decision, whether it be a finance decision, whether it be a legal decision, whatever the decision that you're gonna make right now, right? I'm just pretending this is a chess board here and this is a chess piece that's going on, right? Um, is how is that decision gonna help me get me closer to my goal or further away from my goal? And that's, you know, how does that build and how does that you know duplex build or whatever fit in line uh, with your goals? So um, as for new estate, older, where's the profit going to come from? Are you going to make more profit in the older? Are you going to make more profit in the newer? They're the the, the, the final question. So I just answered it um, from my my view on that front. And then, um, thanks for the questions coming through. Uh, Chris, recently bought a townhouse, will end up be cash flow positive, five to seven grand uh, end of year after depreciation. Looks like on paper it will be negative six to seven grand. Do you think that's enough cash flow uh, to go again for a second one? Lots of um, finer details once again, Chris. What you gotta look at is that if it's getting too negative on paper, is it going to be uh, impacting your servicing for you to build a larger property? portfolio. So you need to look at, you know, after all expenses. So when I look at a property, I want to know that the rent is covering not just the mortgage component, I want to make sure that the rent is covering the mortgage, the council, the water, the insurance, the agent fees, strata fees. I want to make sure that all the associated costs are covered. And then I know that when I've done all my cash flows, I want to know how the back end of the banks will view that property going into my portfolio or into one of my investors' portfolios. So you need to understand a little bit about the finance perspective of what the bank and what each bank's lending criteria will be like to be able to fit that asset into the overall picture because two or three of those properties may impact you from being able to get to four and five and six 
um, you may need a mixture of different types of assets to help you sort of get there. Um, the webinar tomorrow night, we'll be talking a lot more about that, so it'll probably be a good question for tomorrow night's webinar. If you're not in there, make sure you do get amongst the, uh, the webinar tomorrow night. You have to register. Email our team, admin at beinvested.com.au. I think that it's um, completely full and um, we'll have to add people in manually potentially because the webinars only hold 500 people. Um, but I happy that's the sort of stuff that are covering map sessions as well. So, um, Zlat, Zlat apologies if I didn't get the, the pronunciation right. Um, hey Nathan, what is your thought on fixing interest rate as opposed to variable rates given the current cash and printing and debt being created, possibility of rates increasing as opposed to decreasing so banks can recoup costs. Uh, none of my rates are fixed at this point in time. There will be a point where I will fix my rates. Um, I think for me personally, it would be a very silly decision. Um, that's not something I'm doing at the moment, uh, but everybody's position is different. If you'd like, um, tomorrow night's webinar is all, all gonna be about uh, finance, but if you'd like, um, to reach out to my team, I can have one of my finance strategists to overview your position and work out a strategy for the debt accumulation and the debt consolidation phase. So, um, yeah, for a lot of you that may or may not know, I run a finance company, um, I specialise in investor finance to be able to help investors build their portfolios out. Um, the accumulation of debt is very crucial. Uh, the consolidation of debt is very crucial as well. So you need to make sure you've got the right debt instrument to get there. Uh, Daniel, that Disney cartoon about the currency back in the 70s was just brilliant. I never thought I would see a cartoon format. Educational, awesome. Cheers, Nathan. Daniel, thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, like in Birchfeed, I share some very random stuff. As some of you may, I try and keep it on the, the edge of not too, not too weird out there. Um, however, um, yeah, I posted a video the other day. It was a cartoon of Scrooge McDuck, um, and it was very educational. Just question that you know these videos and the whole Hollywood and where everything's made from, it's sort of fantasy land, it's lovely. And you know, there's a lot of the agenda of who funds these projects. You know, if you wanted to invest in one of these, what would you want to get out of your investment? Is it cash, cash flow that you want, or is it an underlying agenda for you know control and you know programming and stuff like that? So, you know, I feel that. You know, the media today, the, the stuff that's being created out there, especially whether it be Netflix or, or whatever that goes on TV, you know, has an underlying agenda to you know create movements in society and different sorts of agendas that get pushed. So back in the old days, you know, it was very interesting. It's interesting that I saw that after after I actually posted it um, in Birchfield, I thought to myself, wonder what the agenda was when they did that. And I was thinking about it. And the currency changed in and around the 70s, right? The dollar came off the gold standard, right? And it's a subliminal programming to get people to understand how currency works now, right? How did it work before? How did it work now? But yeah, uh, check it out, guys. If you're not on Birchfeed, get amongst Birchfeed. Um, yeah, I posted a cool video from the other day. Justin, hope you're doing well, bro. Um, I've got something to email you about. I'm going to try and remember to email you a little bit later. Uh, if I don't, text me and I'll email you. Luke, hey bro, what's your thoughts on deposits for investment property? If you can put down more, let's say 40%, as an example, would you do this? Um, look, it's a good question. Could borderline financial advice. Um, however, I don't give financial advice, so I will talk a little bit about my personal views on how I buy my own personal properties and what I look at when putting a large deposit or a small deposit down. I'm a big fan of buying a property that's below market value with the upside for capital growth and a strong cash flow. Start to remember that, because it's important uh, when looking at this perspective. I'm also a big fan of having the largest asset base, right? Um, I could, uh, let's just use some rough numbers here, right? It's always quite differently. I believe my portfolio is somewhere around the 65 mil at the moment with about 18 and a half mil worth of debt, but just use an example of 50 mil with 20 mil debt, right? I've got 50 mil worth of property. I could um, uh, pay down 20 mil worth of debt, hypothetically. Um, if I was to do that, 
I would have 30 mil portfolio. If the market was to double tomorrow, would I want to double a $30 million portfolio into 60 million? Or would I want to double a 50 mil portfolio into a $100 million portfolio? That's the question you need to ask yourself, right? Is what is your goal? Um, personally, I want the largest asset base that I can take through market cycles and watch it double. So if you could have a deposit, let's say a million dollars, and you could, uh, if you had 400 grand, you could use a 40% deposit um, and have a $600,000 loan and a $400,000 deposit, or potentially you could use that as a 20% deposit on $2 million worth of property. The question you need to ask yourself is would I want to double a million dollars into two million when the market doubles, or do I want to double two million dollars into four million dollars? They're the questions that you need to be asking yourself when making those decisions. Obviously, I'm no financial advisor, and certainly I'm not giving financial advice to anyone here. Uh, Emilio, Nathan, in your mind, what would be a decent, achievable interest rate for an interest-only investment loan? Um, ideally, you know, somewhere around two percent later. Um, I have seen people getting you know, 3%, high twos, low threes. Um, if you'd like to send a, a message or a private message or an email over, uh, I can have one of my finance uh, strategists to have a look at your position and see if we can get a cheaper interest rate. I've literally seen people with a portfolio of like a million dollars worth of debt or $2 million worth of debt save like 20 grand, 30 grand a year from just restructuring their debt. So don't just think, oh, I'm screwed at the moment, I can't do this or I can't do that. There's opportunities out there, you wanna be looking at what you can do, especially at this point in time, to um, you know, minimize my expenses and maximize cash flow. So uh, ideally, you know, somewhere in the twos, could be in the low threes, depending on your position, depending on the banks, um, but feel free to reach out to my team, um, you know, I didn't get 200 properties for no reason or by uh, chance, it came from strategy. Um, these are the same people that have you know, been around me and helped uh, you know, my investors as well as myself build our portfolios. Um, last one is Dave, looking forward to my first property with you, mate. I'm going to send you an email a little bit later on this evening. Um, look forward to helping you kick ass and, and smash those goals, mate. So, um, yeah, I'll be in touch very shortly. Haven't had a chance to even look at my emails today. So, um, on that note, I don't think we've got too many questions here um, from Instagram. I've got a couple here. I'm gonna just one here that I haven't read yet. Uh, Adam, uh, how does one find out the existing expenses on a property, strata, council rates, etc.? Good question. Always ask the real estate agent. Ask them. Please provide me. I'm thinking of buying the property. I need to know what are the council rates, what are the water, what are the strata. They've got a duty of care to give you information and sort of substantiate it as well. You can say, look, that's cool, sounds great. Just before I buy the property, can I get a copy of the council rate, a couple of strata, whatever. Um, ask the agent. They're, they're the ones that want to sell you the property, so make them go and obtain the information for you to be able to make an educated decision to buy the property. Um, or you could use a buyer's agent like myself uh, we're we'll locate properties and negotiate them, and um, I present all that sort of stuff to my investors uh, as a part of the, the service of what I do. So, um, on that note, I'm going to answer one last question, and then I'm going to get to my emails and catch up on a lot of work. So, uh, Donnie, good advice, Nathan. I'm a new follower. Quick question: Are discretionary trusts able to claim land tax thresholds in New South Wales? Um, that would be a question for Ridwan. If you'd like to, Donnie. Um, just flick uh, a, a, just a private message in here with your best contact number um, and I'll get a free 15 minute chat um, with the hottest uh, tax strategist uh, out there in the marketplace when it comes to uh, properties and structuring property portfolios and he can answer that. I don't believe so, um, but I know some trusts can. So you need to go and check uh, with Ridwell on that front. So on that note, guys and girls, thanks a lot for tuning in. I look forward to seeing uh, those of you tomorrow night um, that will be uh, on the webinar. If you're not on it, you have to email my team, message the team, ask me if they can add you in there because uh, I believe that the capacity is being met for the, the 
it has to be added in separately. Um, but yeah, look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow evening. Keep being awesome. And if I don't see you tomorrow evening or you don't see me tomorrow evening, I'll be back here next Tuesday to have chats about all things uh, property investing or anything wacky that you want to chat about as well. So keep being awesome, guys. Stay safe. Watch out for the bullshit media that's trying to program us to be totalitarian fascist little sheeple. Uh, question everything you see. Look at the agenda and think about it. It's important to have creative thinking to go, if they pull this lever, what is going to be the reaction to that action that they're taking? So on that note, guys, stay safe, be awesome. Bye for now.